This is IAT 355 Visual Analytics Lecture 7, where we talk about visual encodings. Today we're going to have two subtopics. Uh, the first is marks and channels, and that formulation comes from Tamara Munzner's book, Chapter 5, particularly the first part of it. And then we're going to talk about what I call cautionary tales, or how to do it wrong in choosing marks and channels. So first, let's get started with... Uh, the first part, marks and channels. All right. So, as I'd said in the previous um, lecture segment, uh, lecture six, uh, the visualization goal is to turn numbers into pictures. That is to say, you have a bunch of data that is about uh, numbers, values, uh, quantities, uh, categories, whatever it may be. And what you'd like to be able to do is take the data that you've got there and transform that into pictures that you, the user can visually interpret, or you as an analyst can visually interpret. This goal that immediately follows from that is once you've turned those um, uh, numbers into pictures, you'd like the depiction of the pictures to be transformed into numbers in the viewer's head, the user's, the analyst's head, and have those numbers, those quantities, those categories be the same thing. It's uh, important to close that loop, not just having the program generate pictures, but have the pictures correspond directly in the user's mind with the numbers that you generate, uh, that you use to generate the, the images. So thus, our ability to draw uh, visualizations need to work well with our perceptual and cognitive systems. In the previous two lecture chunks, uh, lectures five and six, we talked at some length about perception. And in uh, Tamara Munzner's chapter five, she speaks of these concerns at the end of the chapter. We just happen to do it in the opposite order for this lecture series. Lectures five and six are really focused on the kind of stuff, perhaps focused in a bit more depth than she does, uh, uh, focused on the stuff that ha happens at chapters uh, 5.5 and beyond. Now we're gonna talk about the first part of the work that she engages in, in chapter five. So. Um, one of the things that Munzner does for us in her book is to provide an organizational suite of ideas as to how to think of various elements of the visualization enterprise. And one of the things that she does is to create an organizational idea about what you can do with marks, how to select them, and what they are good for. Um, this is derived from, to some degree, from one of the earliest works in this domain, uh, a book called uh, Semiology Graphique, or Semiology of Graphics, written by uh, Jacques Bertin in 1967. He was a geographer and was interested in creating a systematized way of drawing maps such that the maps could be readily understood. Now, his medium was a bit different from ours. His medium was exclusively maps on paper. And so he developed this organizational idea, which he called retinal variables. And there's a direct correspondence to Bertin's retinal variables and the marks and channels concept uh, that uh, uh, Munzner presents in chapter five. So let's briefly go through the um, retinal variables here. They're summarized visually in this great table. And so we have over on the left, the variables that we have access to. And his formulation is fairly similar to what we've seen so far. The idea is the one of the fundamental things that you do with developing visualizations is you put marks on paper in his case. And there are various visual properties of what you can do with marks on paper. And so let's go through these now very briefly. So the variables of the image are things like you wanted to draw points, lines, or areas points, lines, or areas, and that's in the right hat three columns, major columns in this uh, table that he's got here. And what you can do with each of these things is place points, lines, and areas at an X location and a Y location on the page. Okay, so X, Y, two dimensions of the plane. They're somewhere on the image, okay? The next thing you can do with that stuff is you can control the size of that thing. And it's given in the examples here for point. We have a big box, a medium box, and a small box. Uh, thick lines, thin lines, uh, circles in this case in the area. Big circles, small circles. The next thing you can do is control the area. Uh, sorry, the value of it. And by that he means lightness or um, 
uh, or luminance. And so very dark value, a light value, uh, lines that are dark, gray, light, and same with area. And the next thing you can do is to put textures on them. This is something that we don't do so much in um, um, computer graphics driven visualization, interactive computer graphics visualization, but in the mapping case it was a little bit more common. Uh, and he's just in giving an indication of texture, uh, finely textured, medium textured, coarse textured. Uh, in this case on the lines it's stripes, same in, uh, in the map it's stripes. Uh, color, of course, colored uh, points, colored lines, colored areas, uh, and orientation, uh, vertical, rotated 30 degrees, rotated say uh, um, 120 degrees, um, and uh, similarly with rotating lines along the, the course of a pathway. You could imagine in the mapping case the purpose of the line is to indicate ro roads or railroads or th things like that. And finally he lists shape, uh, and in the case of points it's you know uh, box, triangle, circle, and other sh shapes that you could probably name. In the lines case, it's a dotted line with square dots, uh, triangular dots, circular dots, and similarly uh, with uh, areas filling with you know circles, squares, etc. Over here on the left, you have uh, essentially an ordered list of what's the most to least effective, most effective at the top, least effective at the bottom, and the things they can do for you. And it's the things they can do for you that's really the value here. So this not equals sign indicates, sorry, how well uh, those uh, marks uh, uh, um, controlled in this way that we're showing here are able to depict equality or inequality. So it, are two things different? That's something that you want to be able to determine by looking. And almost all of these marks are good at depicting things as being the same thing or a different thing. And then finally, in the first column of the symbology here, it's uh, Bertans illustrating whether things can depict ordinal, that's what the O stands for, quantitative, that's what the Q means, or, and finally, um, similar, and that's what the triple horizontal lines are about. So exposition and size are good for quantitative, those have Q there. Uh, um, you can put value as ordinal, if you have a kind of tightly constrained range. Um, and um, you can also depict equality uh, or similarity by location, say clusters of things. However, once you move out of the uh, kind of geometric marks, uh, x, y location, size, value, uh, you're no longer really able to depict um, ordinal. So th there's an O here, but it's depicted as kind of a lightweight O, meaning it's not very good for doing ordinal. And um, these uh, texture, color, orientation, and shape are okay for depicting things as being similar or the same, as well as not the same, but the effectiveness decreases as we go down this diagram. Okay, so that's Bertin's uh, schema. And I'm just simply on this slide, it kind of put, putting the, the, the answer key to how this thing works. So O means order, and that means these two, three variables are pretty good, and this one's kind of okay at depicting things that are, can be ordered visually. Uh, Q means quantitative or quantity, just uh, location and size does quantity. Uh, so the triple equals thing, this guy here, that's good for similarity and difference or inequality. Um, pretty much everything's good for inequality. So each retinal variable, the marks that you make, either points, lines, or curves, uh, or areas, has its strengths and uh, strengths and weaknesses. And variables for ordered data, size and value, are not really suitable, he makes this point clear, uh, not suitable if you just want to see something the same or different. So. You can, of course, use some of this stuff to depict similarity or difference, but the problem is, is if you use something like size to indicate that one thing's different from another, you're also perhaps improperly making one category that of the bigger thing be somehow larger or more important or more interesting or more exciting, whatever it is, than the smaller thing, and that's something that you always have to watch out for. Okay, so 
The equivalent suite of concepts put together in chapter uh, five is uh, marks and channels, okay? Now, she does a good job of separating into two parts these important aspects. So the first aspect is the thing that you saw in the right three columns, uh, you know, three thick columns uh, in Bertin's diagram. So geometric marks are, once again, points, lines, and or curves, and areas. Okay, and in some visualizations we use points, think of scatter plots, and we also use lines, perhaps as, uh, uh, you know, ways of depicting the path of something like that. Um, you often see that in geographical displays. And areas are used in things like um, uh, bar charts I implicitly, they're kind of sort of used in pie charts. You also see them in various tree-like diagrams, which is what this thing on the right is intended to get across. We'll talk about that later, uh, that technique later on in the term. There's another kind of subset of uh, marks that uh, uh, are depicted in chapter five, and that is for networks or graphs, as they are also called, there are uh, uh, graphical uh, marks that you can make that depict containment. And so here we have this kind of uh, light gray um, rectangular polygon surrounding three dots here. That's meant to indicate that these somehow or other are all part of the same whole, you know, they're perhaps a subcategory of something. And another mark that's very important that you see all the time is contain uh, connection, uh, line segments that connect one dot from another, where a dot stands for, say, in a mapping application location. So this is Vancouver, that's Chilliwack, that's Kelowna, or something like that. Um, and so the, the, the line segment indicates that there is a, you know, a highway between those uh, three cities. Okay, so those are marks. What you can do with those marks is what uh, Munzner calls channels. So the channel is a visual feature, and we're all familiar with this, and we've spoken about that kind of implicitly throughout the, the previous two lectures, segments, and in fact throughout the term. So the channels are visual features such as um, position uh, on a horizontal uh, scale, position on a vertical scale, and position in 2D, and think of these as being scatter plotted points here. Uh, next on the right we have color, the color of the plotted thing, be a, we're showing uh, lines or curves here, but the idea is that the, the, the color tells you something about what's going on in the underlying data. Next here in, is shape, I'm just sort of reading, doing this in reading order, triangle, star, etc, etc. Shape could be more than just, you know, the shape of the point, it could be the shape of the overall, uh, some more complex geometry. Tilt or rotation of a mark, typically you'd think of that as a scatter plotted point. Um, uh, size, that is to say the length of something, and closely related to size, that's for, you know, one-dimensional items here, line segments, for two-dimensional items, it's area, and for three-dimensional items, it's volume. So all of those things are channels that we can perceive, uh, particularly in this last one, we're probably not so accurate at understanding the number that's sitting behind area or volume, but we are capable of seeing it in a visualization display. So that's why we're showing these things as visual features. And this is what uh, Munster calls channels. So a very important point that she makes is that there are two broad channel types. Um, and that is uh, channels that have to do with identity and channels that have to do with things that are not just, you know, is this a thing or not a thing? So, for example, you know, if you want a channel uh, to depict whether, you know, um, the, the, the people are in first, second, third, or fourth year of a university, you would have four separate depictions, and it might be the case that you want to treat each of those four things, each of those years in the program equally, and so you have a different mark for, that, for each of the four years, for example. And this is um, where you want to identify you know, where, what is there, and where is it, and single individual items. And the equivalence here with the channel type of identity is Bertin's uh, similarity or similarity or uh, inequality uh, um, depictions as shown in the table in the, in the slide number three. And the kinds of things that you can use to depict um, uh, identity is shape, color, stipple and texture, or motion. And the kinds of variables that you would depict with the visual identity channel are nominal slash categorical. Uh, Munzner calls 
nominal variables, pretty much universally categorical variables, but you know, I'll ask you to recall my little proviso from a number of lectures ago. The other major channel type is magnitude. And what you uh, want to do with a magnitude channel is you want to do uh, uh, ask, answer questions such as, is de depicted item A more than or less than depicted item B? And that would be something you would ask, say, of an ordinal variable. Another thing that you might want to do is have the user be able to understand by looking whether this, the quantity of this thing is, you know, equal to, to some number you've got in mind. And the quantity of this compared to the quantity of that, you can see the quantity of that is larger. And you want to be able to depict that and have the user visually perceive that. And in Bertin's system, um, the similarity there is to o, o, o and Q, or ordinal and quantitative. So what can you do to depict magnitude uh, channels? And that is size with the area, length, uh, length, area, height, luminance and saturation, but not together, uh, tilt, relative position, and speed of moving things. We haven't spoken too much about speed or motion as a means of depicting things in visualization. We might take that up somewhat later in the term. So what kind of variables? As you might expect, the variable types that you can do with magnitude channel, the channel that you can, where you can perceive magnitude is, surprise, ordinal and quantitative data items. So ordinal and quantitative assigned to magnitude channels, nominal slash categorical data assigned to identity channels. Bear in mind that when you assign nominal and categorical to say an ordinal channel, a magnitude channel, what happens is that sometimes you might accidentally think of a category as the viewer, think of a category as somehow being bigger if all you wanted really to depict were that some category is different from another. Let's move forward. So here's an example of uh, a scatter plot in which this is um, using link uh, node marks, point marks, in which there are a number of different items depicted. There is the thing corresponding to the red, uh, blue circle, the blue square, the orange square, the orange X, the red circle, etc. And so those are answering questions of identity. Presumably somewhere there would be a, a, a key that says, what do X's stand for? What do circles stand for? Or perhaps what do orange X stand for, uh, X's stand for? There's only one, but let's just say. To do magnitude, you would use, um, you know, sort of things in which the length of something or the some geometric visual measure of something is depicted. And so here we see a sequence of bar charts uh, that are showing uh, something about um, affect, uh, affect one ver and what kind of affect, calm, disturbing, exciting, and so on and so forth. And so this is comparing pairs of things, and so that's why you see this kind of diagonal feature where there's nothing in the lower left uh, diagonal, the lower left corner. So, however, th the fact in this scatter plotted uh, situation, these uh, plotted points are located at some vertical dimension, say 180,000 in this case for the X, we're also not only having identification marks, you know, orange X, as I'd said before, or orange circle, we're also showing that the X value, the, the vertical extent of that thing is 180,000, whereas the vertical extent of this uh, orange circle is 160,000. Similarly, we're using color over here in this display on the right, where we're using color to depict something that's important, and that color, in that case, is being used to enable identification of something in the display. So here's another example of using channels and marks. In this case, this is, uh, you know, uh, another bar chart. And uh, what we're plotting here is infant mortality. That's what the vertical dimension is. And uh, across the bottom are a number of countries. And further, for those number of countries, there's a color key here in which uh, a, um, a further identification of which continent those countries are located is also depicted. And we're using color to indicate continent. So Ethiopia is blue, and that's in Africa, whereas um, you know Pakistan is orange, because that's in Asia. So here we have this quantitative var variable, infant mortality, and this 
categorical, uh, this identity, this uh, nominal data across the bottom that's indicating the country. And this is acting as a category up here because the category is which continent the country uh, is on. So the identity channel is what's being used here, and that's the horizontal position. Okay, and really, there's no ordering. With a, there is an ordering, but it's in ordering from smallest to largest. But there's no implicit or implied ordering of anything else about the country other than the value that comes here. And the magnitude channel is used here, and that is being mapped to the height of the bar. And finally, there's a, an identity uh, to do with the mark of the bar. Uh, the line mark and that is associated with a color that you can use to pick off which continent is involved. So that's a quick example of uh, using both uh, magnitude and identity marks in the same plot. Uh, you uh, do occasionally see this. Another organizational thing that you might uh, see in a plot like this is that the region or continent uh, is is used as an organizational schema. So you see, you know, all the European countries and then all the Oceania countries or something, whatever it may be, uh, perhaps in some geographical order from east to west, whatever it may be, and that's the organizational idea. And then you plot the points according to region, uh, uh, according to the values for each country. But, you know, you have a regional grouping that's ge um, geometrically located together. Um, uh, but that's not what happened here. These things are plotted according to value. So you can think of there being a bunch of visual decoding tasks, and let's go through these again. The first is selection and discrimination, and the question is, is A different from B, where A is one of these things and B is the other, and that's the equivalent of the not equals thing shown in Bertin's system. Next is association, and that's um, similar to the equivalence or uh, similarity mark in Bertin's system. And these two things are similar to each other because they have a similar color. Uh, and I'm just using that as a convenient uh, method to you know, depict similarity or difference. Uh, they are also presumably different from each other because it's a square versus a triangle. So both of those things are um, the questions of selection and discrimination. Is A different from B? Uh, and are A and B similar in some way, those are associated with the identity channel. F um, th on this page, we see um, questions that are would be associated with the quantitative channel, with the magnitude channel. And so questions of order, is A greater than B? And so you would imagine that A, if it were associated with the first square, is larger than B because the square is larger than the triangle. And that's associated with the big letter O in Bertin's table. And fourth here is quantification of value, uh, and that is how much is A, how much uh, smaller is A than B in this case, and ac across the bottom here is, um, is a scale so that you can indicate uh, to uh, what the length of the bar means across all of the bars that may be plotted. There's only two here, but um, uh, that does tell you that this value B is, you know, roughly four or something like that, and the value B is maybe three and a half or three. Last on this list is another question of capacity, and that is what number of distinctions is po uh, are possible using the variable? Uh, how many different things can we represent? We spoke about those capacity issues in lectures um, uh, five and six, uh, where we're interested in you know, how well you can discriminate one thing from another. And in the second segment today, we'll talk about that as well. So once again, the value uh, uh, channel or the magnitude channel, those are going to be associated with uh, questions where you need to know the order and questions where you need to know the value of things for ordinal or quantitative data. So visual variables for selectivity, the first of those four, is the goal is we want to see that dis different values in the data are depicted as different things. Is a, and the question is, is A different than B? And the kinds of things that are good for that are hue, uh, shape, and, and texture, although we don't use texture too much in interactive visualizations. And <clears throat> however, 
once again, the worst case of this is uh, if visual properties of all objects need to be looked at one by one. That is to say, if you combine a bunch of visual properties such as shape and color and texture and who knows what else you can, might be able to come up with all on the same mark, then the kind of work that you're asking the user to do is kind of um, somewhat cognitive. They have to look at a, a mark and be able to kind of decode it by teasing apart shape from color, say, or whatever it may be. You recall from the pre-attentive lecture, uh, the, uh, lecture five, that if it was just one variable, you could pick off the thing that's, say, different from the others. But if there are two variables combined, say, shape and color, then it requires a, a certain amount of, of staring at the display in order to pick, uh, decode it. Next is with respect to associativity. The goal there is can similar values be easily um, grouped together? Uh, is A similar to B, where A and B stand for two separate marks? And generally, uh, positioning, say, of things in a scatter plot or other like display um, is better at enabling you to do that uh, than color and orientation, which is a little bit better than texture, which is better than shape. But the key point to bear in mind here is although positioning can associate things, think of using uh, position to indicate clusters, as we talked about in a previous example, you don't want to use channels which are kind of accidentally suggesting some kind of order where, you, where there isn't one in the data. Uh, so you need to always watch out for that. For visual variables that actually do have an order, uh, the goal here is to um, show it where each value is larger, smaller, or the same size, roughly, as the others. You don't necessarily have uh, uh, any indication of how much bigger or how much smaller is. You just need to be able to depict the order. Is, uh, and the question there is, is A more than, greater than, or bigger than B? Uh, but you're not so interested in magnitude. You don't, you're not necessarily focusing on the question, is A twice as big as B? You just want to know if A is bigger than B, and that's it. Um, so position, size, and brightness of marks are, are ordered. Um, however, orientation, shape, and texture are not. So if you need to depict something ordered and you want to be able to, be able to see that order, th these are the channels that you need to use. Hue is not really ordered. Um, hue itself isn't, um, uh, but uh, brightness is. And so there's this interesting kind of conflation of concerns where you might uh, uh, you know, have a pair of hues and a different set of brightnesses. So you need to watch out for combining those two. Well, finally, once again, quantity. Uh, and the goal is a number can be deduced from a reference uh, or from differences between things, and you have some marks, and you're able to pick off, you know, to visually perceive the lengths, the size, the quantities from that. So questions are things like, how much is A? And how much, what's the difference between A and B? And you can come up with a number reasonably accurately. And here's, once again, that uh, length of display. And so um, positions better than size is better than value, meaning the HSV value, uh, but the other variables are not quantitative. Um, and uh, value is nowhere near as useful as, say, position is. With respect to this other uh, um, thing called capacity, the goal is uh, to see how many number of distinctions is possible, how many different things can we perceive given this visual channel. And we spoke about that with respect to color uh, on, on two lectures ago where we introduced, um, you know, sort of the 12 colors that Colin Ware had identified, you know, red, green, blue, yellow, black, white being the first six. Um, you, you know, with, with hue, you can distinguish, say, 10 to 12 here, but if you want to associate things, less is better simply because, you know, coming up with the color and recognizing it as being a different from another color, particularly with small points being plotted, you know, you overdo it with respect to the skills of your visualization system if you're not careful. So shape and, you know, these things, you know, our perceptual system is great, but if you want to pick off uh, clearly distinguished categories from these visual uh, properties, there's not as much room there as you desire. And we'd spoken about this already in, in earlier lectures where uh, transforming you know, these, these, these kind of color variables and other kind of uh, channels, mark channels into numbers, that's a bit fraught, except in things where, you know, it's really easy for people to perceive 
you know, values that are very close to uh, what the depicted value are. And length is being, if you recall, is the, the key value that people are able to pick off. Okay, so at the start of chapter uh, five, um, you will see this display. It's also repeated a little bit further on. And this is, uh, in essence, a summarization of what the chapter is about. Um, and so the order has been reversed, uh, but um, I, I think for a good reason. There are one, so once again, there are two, th two broad sets of um, uh, attributes that you can do things. So for ordered attributes, ordered or quantitative, uh, for the magnitude channel, we have a number of things that we can do. And um, uh, Munzner speaks of effectiveness and the capability of uh, uh, people to understand the thing that you're translating from numbers to pictures. And up at the top, once again, we have the most effective thing, and that is position on a common scale. Um, uh, next most effective is position on an unaligned scale. Um, here we're just showing the scales displaced from each other, but um, so we're not as good as picking off the, those two values and comparing them as we would be picking off these two where the, there's a common zero. Next is length without scale. Um, next is tilt or angle, uh, then area, um, and then depth if you're doing 3D, but the big proviso there is if you're doing 3D, you, the 3D object that you're depicting on the screen needs to be animated. It needs to be controlled directly by you interactively. If it's animated kind of by itself, your ability to understand what's going on is a little less effective. Um, if you kind of have it in, in your hands in kind of the VR style, it's a bit more effective. But, you know, 3D is something that um, is very very hard to get right in a, in a way that, that uh, users can really understand what's going on. I had been doing 3D for a number of years in the, in the 1990s and the 2000s, and it's, it's great for uh, understanding very complex things, but in my opinion, the thing you really need to be able to do is to hold it in your hand and rotate it in your hand in a three-dimensional uh, interaction. Um, doing this by, you know, sort of uh, with the display on the desktop and the display is mostly static probably doesn't work well. In any case, people can tell the depth of things, particularly if they know what size they are, but it's not easy. Uh, less effective still are things like color luminance and color saturation, but if you were to combine those things, you're asking for trouble because you would get integral perception of color uh, if you were to have uh, uh, luminance and saturation somehow mixed because they're part of two separate variables. That won't work if they'll be perceived as a single color. Uh, last on this list, it, to do with the shape of things, um, is a curvature of the object and the super quadrix thing I showed at the end of the previous lecture is partially about curvature um, and volume or 3D size. So remember that area and volume, you know, are, 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 length is good, area is okay, and volume isn't very good. It's a similar kind of ordering here. For the identity channels, we have spatial region, as in to say the location of things. Think of scatter plotting and clustering scatter pl plotted points there. Uh, color or hue, just hue alone, not luminance and saturation. Uh, motion versus not motion and shape. Okay, so that's the list of uh, the capabilities. You want to use these ones when you're thinking about uh, identity channels, categorical variables, categorical uh, nominal variables, that kind of thing. And if you have uh, variables that are ordered or quantitative, you need to do these things. Okay, so once again, I'm kind of repeating this point a little bit, but w it looks as though we have this kind of menu of things and if you just add things together, add things together, you'll get a display in which there's, you know, lots of variables and you can understand lots of things. The problem is that these variables are not independent from each other in the way you'd like. Um, and by way you'd like, I mean the way in which would simplify the task of turning numbers into pictures. In fact, what goes on is some of these things interfere with other things. I'd certainly already given you the example of hue interfering with luminance and saturation. Um, 
Uh, if you have all three of those things in the display, you're asking for trouble. And I'm going to, in the next segment, give you examples of trouble being asked for and received um, in visual depictions. So our decoding ca capacity is limited. Um, and the more you put the visual decoding capacity in the province, as it were, of having the user have to think about it, the, the less, generally speaking, the less effective the visual display is. Later on in the term, and also in Munzner's book, she talks about uh, all sorts of ways in which you can kind of sidestep this problem of limited perceptual and visual capacity by organizing the way in which the display is la uh, laid out. Here, what we're focusing on is, let's say all you've got is one image, one screen to do your plotting on. What do you do? What are the orders? Later on, we'll talk about other aspects that are equally important uh, to enable you to plot more variables and deal with uh, uh, relating things in a complex data set uh, together. But it's not just you know, picking seven all of these things and trying to plot everything. That won't work. Instead, what you need to do is organize your way around it. And the reason why you need to organize around it is because our decoding capacity is limited as people. All of us have these limits. And so therefore, because we all have these limits, we need to plan our way around it and select carefully amongst the visual display uh, channels that we have available to us. OK, so that uh, ends uh, uh, lecture 7.1, Marks and Channels, from tomorrow, tomorrow Munzner's book, Chapter 5.